sweeping. Ain't easy, guys, but the Marlins get the sweep done against the Oakland A's. They are scorching hot, and they now welcome the Kansas City Royals. What would the Marlins give for back-to-back -back sweeps? Also, we need to dig into it. Should Sandy Alcantara be booed in a game? The reigning Cy Young. I think you've already heard my opinion, but I'm going to get Sean's opinion. Sean Barrett, the UK GOAT, is in the house on today's Locked On Marlins. You are Locked On Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings from England. Welcome to Locked On Marlins, guys. This, of course, is your daily Marlins podcast. I'm your host, Peter Pratt, of course. Hit me up on Twitter, at Miami Marlins underscore UK. If you're listening to the pod, hit subscribe. Of course, this is your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Marlins your first listen of the day. There is a YouTube channel. Head on over to there. It is Locked On Marlins. Hit subscribe also. You will see Sean Barrett, as I've already teased out, is in the house. Sean, it's a Monday. How are we doing, brother? It's a Monday, so I've got to be here. I'm a little bit dinged up, but mm. the, the Marlins are, are hot right now. And mm. uh, a particular player that I'm sure we're going to get into is hot right now. So I had to jump on. Absolutely, baby. We are going to spend a ton of time talking about Jacob Stallings in today's episode. <laughs> For sure. Uh, yeah, glad you're doing better, mate. Dinged up is right. Uh, not quite the Cooper Loop issue with the inner ear issue, but... Uh, uh, a ding to the bonds, I think, uh, in practice, right? So uh, hopefully you're recovering well, mate, and hopefully you're doing all right, and you'll be back to full strength, back on the field soon. Absolutely, yeah. Now, shoulders starting to play up a bit as well now, so that's uh -oh. my main concern. But first day's practice, and, and there's, you'll have to rip me off the field. There we go. That's what we like to hear. That's what we like to hear. We also like to hear about the Marlins getting sweeps, baby. We said, Sean, that this was a critical part of the schedule. And it's time for them to cash in. You know, there's no automatic sweeps in baseball. I know the A's record is not great, but they came in having beat the Braves <laughs> in the series ahead of uh, heading into Miami. So the A's, by their standards, were hot. This could have been a trap series for the Marlins, but they find a way to get it done. It looked a touch ropey in game three, I'm not going to lie. But overall, mate, sweeping ain't easy, but the Marlins... Get it done. What does that say about this year's club? It says that we continue to see a team that are now not just at 500, they're above 500 and, and they're, they're creeping through. And, and you're right with the sweeps. I mean, yeah, the, the A's are, are dreadful. And, we, and historically so, the, the, the national media are absolutely lambasting them and the, the, the whole way that they're being run right now. Mm -hmm. And you look at like their previous form, swept by the Astros, swept in a four-game series by the Mariners, swept again by the Astros, but then take two from the Braves. And it is a case of, like, did the Braves take them for granted? Oh, this is just a simple turn turn up and, and win three games. It doesn't work like that. These no. these guys, as, as bad as they are, and, and as, as they're going to lose 100 games, they're going to lose 110 games, 120 games, who knows? But they're professional players and, and they're going to turn up every single night and, and try and get a win. They're going to play. You know, they're in a bad situation right now, but they've got their careers to think about. They've got their next step to go. They need to put some, they need to put the numbers up. They need to put some, some stuff on film. And that's what they're going to be doing. They're going to be thinking about what's next after I, I leave this dreadful organization. And we've been there as Marlins fans. They're, 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 we know it. They're tough days to get through, but yeah, they are. on every night, you've got a chance to play spoiler. Uh, and the Marlins, luckily, were able to, to walk away with four free wins. Yeah, absolutely, mate. And, and you know, we can absolutely, you know, we, we know what this feels like. So the A's fans that are going through it right now, we know we've been there, guys, and we sympathize with this. And to your point as well, this is the interesting bit with these clubs that are doing poorly. The players on the field aren't trying to lose. There is no, I'm trying to lose this game on purpose. This is tank mode, as in we're trying to lose games. Those guys are out there giving it their all because every single at-bat in, in today's game, it counts. Everything counts. And there'll be 
negotiations later down the line where they will rely on this year's numbers. And so the A's, all of the guys are playing for something. And if it's not the team and the team record, it's at least themselves, which doesn't create the best uh, team environment, some would say. But, you know, that's the point you're making, right? Is these guys, they've always got something to fight for. And on any given day, anything can happen in baseball. And sweeps are not automatic. The Marlins had a, you know, they had three games here against the A's. They won all three, as we've already labored on. But they won each of those games in very different ways, Sean. This is what I enjoyed particularly about the Marlins and, and this series was they found different ways to win games against the A's with the different questions they were asked through that. So it feels it feels impressive, you know, as, as impressive as a sweep can be against the A's. It felt impressive the different types of wins that they had to they had to deliver on this weekend, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that last game was 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 key t- for me as far as they went through some struggles. Mm. You know, the, the the first two games were were relatively easy. You know, there were some concerns. Obviously, it was a close game. Uh, no, it wasn't a close game. Sorry, in the Erie Perez. So we find kind of felt lucky because his pitch count was coming up and up and up. And I, mm. I had a bit of a concern, but because there were so many runs on the board, you you felt safe. Once once you're getting up into near double digits, you're, you're against the A's, who you know aren't going to put up a lot of runs, you yeah. felt pretty safe. But that, that last game, you know, it, it got pretty dicey. And it, it took some real it took some real key hits um, for, mm-hmm. for the Marlins to, to get through to get that win. Yeah, it really did. They had to find a way to come from behind again. And actually, it was a sizable deficit. And this is the difference with this year's club. In previous years, this club may not have even won this series. They would have found a way to have squandered. Even last year, I look back to last year, they finally, you know, they get themselves into contention. We'd then be thinking as fans, right, hey, here we go. Pedal down, let's go. And they drop the series, get swept. And you think, boy, oh boy. And it was just that constant issue of like just never quite being able to put it together at the times that mattered. That's the difference with this club. Not only are they beating teams they should be, they're beating them in ways, impressive ways, You've got a 4-0 to you know, start it all off, a shutout, including an opposite field bomb from Jesus Sanchez. You then you blow the back doors off him in game two. The offense comes alive. Uri Perez twirls a gem. And then they find a way to come from 5-1 down to win it 7-5. They got some help from the A's in the back end of that game, no doubt. I mean, boy, oh boy, what was going on in that eighth inning uh, for the A's and their defense. But overall, you know, Luis Arias put the ball in play and I must say, Luis Arias, mate, his name isn't on the agenda, but it should be. What a series for Arias. A five for five day, including three doubles. Um, he just missed a homer as well. I'm not sure I've seen any hitting like this in, in the time I've ever watched the game, to be honest with you. So, you know, people will probably talk to players of the past and go, hey, remember this guy. But for me, in the last, what, seven seasons as a Marlins fan, I haven't seen anyone like Luis Arias. He's absolutely incredible, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I think I, I saw a clip earlier today talking about players that hit 390 for the season, which mm. at this point, we can't put it past the riders. And we're talking Tony Gwynn from 1993. That's how far ago we're talking. We're talking 30 years since we've seen a player like this. And Tony Gwynn was just an animal. Yeah. Uh, really, do could really hit. Uh, and that's where he is. That's that's the, that's the pedigree that we're talking about. Yeah, uh, and the the longer that we go through the season, like the national media now really start to pick up on the idea of you know, this guy's having an historic season, mm. uh, and and not very often can we say that about a Marlins player, um, especially no. with a stick. But, but as I was going to say, mate, particularly a, an offensive guy. I don't think we've had any historic, uh, historically good offensive performance. Obviously, we had a historic performance last year with the number of innings where they didn't score consecutively. So, you know, that just shows this team is different and it it shouldn't go unnoticed. And just this is the final point before we uh, hit the ads. And then we want to talk about Sandy Alcantara specifically, but it shouldn't go unnoticed. I must say, Sean, how much of an impact a guy like Yuli Gurriel is having here. He's hitting, he's, he's hitting over his career mark. He's playing solid, solid defense at first base and necessary with all the kind of, issues that Coop's had in the last couple of weeks. You know, last year we felt like first base was a strength and it turned out to be the complete opposite. This year we were kind of a little bit concerned thinking, what happens if Coop's dinged? Who's going to fill in? How's first base going to play out? 
first base has become a position of strength here, and Gurriel is a big part of that, right? Yeah, I mean, he's been a real stable of us in uh, force for the Marlins, and I think that's been something that the team should be um, we should be positive about. I mean, you talked about very early in the season the idea that they're bringing in veterans, they're bringing mm-hmm. in proven veterans who might be somewhat over the hill, and we've seen what's happened with with Segura, but bringing in Yuli at the at the death of spring training to come in and it's been so valuable to have him rather than picking up a guy that's in AAA because we've seen you know, every time a guy's hot in AAA comes up and yep. hits a buck 50. Yep. Having Yuli on that lineup, you can trust him. He's going to hit for contact. And again, that's another thing that the Marlins have, have put into force this year. We want contact hitters, guys that aren't going to go into these lengthy, lengthy, doldrums of hitting 150. Yeah, He's not going to hit for power. He's got no speed. I mean, he's nearly 40, for Christ's sake. Mm. <laughs> you don't expect him to have any speed. No. But he's coming in and he's being a professional. And that's what the Marlins sometimes have missed. When a guy goes down or you need an off day, you need a professional Major League Baseball player to come in, not some kid who's still trying to work out what they're doing and how they're going to be a ball player. Absolutely. It's been a marked difference this year in, in the guys that that Kim added as depth pieces. Your depth pieces become Yuli Gurriel. They become Garrett Hampson. You know, these guys that, and even to a point now, Jonathan Davis. You know, these guys have knocked around Major League Baseball for years, at a high, and Gurriel in particular, at a high level. And so, you know, and we're, we're talking about him going into the year as, you know, as a depth dude. Uh, again, it shouldn't go unnoticed. He now has, I believe... Three triples on the year. Three triples for Yuli Gurriel. What is going on? I mean, maybe I may I might be incorrect. Maybe it's two, but I feel like he's at three. Is it three? Three triples for Gurriel. That is insane. Insane for him. Um, speaking about insane, let's talk about our good friends over at eBay Motors and the insane graphics they've got up, baby. Um and for a championship team like the Marlins in 2023, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to the My Garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride! eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Absolutely nailed that ad read, I must say. And uh, what also struck with me is I wish the Marlins uh, had the ability to have the, the guaranteed fit. And uh, if they <laughs> if it didn't fit, then they could send back a part uh, and get their money back. I think they may well have wished that was available for Avisel Garcia. Um, but we digress. Let's talk about Sandy Alcantara. I was unhappy I was unhappy at what I heard and the reaction that greeted the Cy Young, the current, the reigning Cy Young, Sandy Alcantara, after having one rough inning with a couple of a couple of singles and a and a and a couple of pitch clock violations that it all did kind of snowball. But Sandy Alcantara at home, when the Marlins are at that point, three games over 500, being booed. The game isn't even up. They, okay, they were up by four runs at this point, the A's. Um, but, Sean, I, I put my opinion out there on Twitter kind of live. I'm interested to get your opinion because I must say the reaction to that video and reaction that I put out there was mixed. Some people some completely agreed. Some people felt it's a fan's prerogative to boo. Um, where do you sit on this one specifically for Sandy Alcantara? Specifically for Alcantara, it's, it's ridiculous. It is, yes, fan is short for fanatic. We're, we're mm. crazy. And <laughs> it is a case of, like, there are players that deservedly deserve to be booed. 
Yeah. And, and Sandy might be having a rough go of it right now, but he's Alex. He's a Cy Young winner. He He's committed to the team. He's, yeah. he's a long-term contract to the team. I don't get it. I mean, I'm not a big booer. Um, I'm not a big cheerer either, actually. I'm not very effusive with anything, but the idea to boo Sandy is, to me, ridiculous. These are the kind of things that you see from Yankees fans and, and Cardinals fans. Oh, and, and that's why everybody hates them, because they're so wishy-washy. They'll, they'll be praising the guy one day and booing him the next and, and vice versa. I just don't get it. For, for me, Sandy is, is, is a proven ace. He's a proven Marlin. As in, he's signed up, he's, he's, he's ready to go long-term with this team. He is going to be a Marlin for many years. And yeah. I don't get it. He's going through a bit of a rough stretch. And to be fair to him, if you look at the numbers, yeah, they're rough for him. But it's not like he's having disasters every single game. It's just that we've, we've grown up so, so used to him being perfect. Mm-hmm. He's not perfect. You ask the question of what's going on, but to boo him, anybody that booed him, I mean, seriously, never go back to Lone Depot Park. You're not welcome. Poor form. Poor, poor form. The funny thing is with Sandy as well, I was watching yesterday's game, you know, enjoying a, a glass or two of Rioja as you do on a, on a Sunday. It was a glorious day. First couple of innings, I was like, boy, oh boy, this could be a 75 pitch complete game shutout here. Like this could be a perfecto going. Like Sandy just looked immense out of the blocks feels like that's kind of been the mo of the marlins pitching actually this year just in general as a group where they just seem to come out hot then all of a sudden have one inning where the wheels come off and they came off a touch yesterday for sandy but the impressive part though mate was how he rebounded after that third inning you know going you know almost perfect again after that and and the other the other you know, just we'll talk about his resilience i guess at that point the other interesting part was he was at 70-something pitches going, and all of a sudden, there were guys up in the pen. And, I, you know, we spoke about it on this episode, and the everyday is listening will know this, that we've questioned Skip Schumacher's management, game management of Sandy Alcantara, maybe giving him a touch too much leash. Yesterday, to me, started to signal actually – Things have changed a touch in that regard as well. So, but firstly, on the resilience of Sandy to come back almost perfect, pretty much coming back after that inning. And equally, maybe there is a change here with Skip Schumacher and his management of Sandy moving forwards. Yeah, I mean, you look at the numbers and, you know, seven strikeouts in seven innings, no walks. He got a bit babbipped about, didn't he? Those he did. singles here and there. And yeah. he has struggled this year with, with left on base percentage, which is something that, you know, I know we don't talk about a lot, but it's key. It is an idea that, you know, getting out for Sandy specifically as well. I mean, his numbers used to be insane with that double play ball. You yeah. get into a little bit of trouble and you get out the inning straight away. This year, that's not happened so much. Is no. it partly the shift? Is it partly the defense? I mean, his FIP numbers pretty bang on. So I think there is a bit of unluckiness for him. And then when the wheels go off, then they can they can go off quickly in baseball. We see that all the time. Um, but I, I believe Sandy, the real Sandy that we are used to is in there somewhere um, and we'll start to see more and more sort of flashes of that. And I think that's what we saw yesterday, the other day, is the idea that he bounced back straight away uh, and and did what he needed to do to keep the team in it. I mean, when things go wrong, usually you don't expect to see the pitch go seven. And I think with Skip, you're right. It is a case of he's learning, not on the job. I think that would be unfair to say, but you're, you're certainly seeing progression. You're seeing learning. You're seeing changes when they need to make changes. And just getting a guy up, having that safety blanket of if if we need him, we can bring him in. Um, and, and then, you know, let's let's save Sandy for another day. We don't need him going deep, deep if, if the wheels are coming off. Um, but no, Sandy buckled down, got the job done got the win, got the sweep. It's all that matters, right? He, post-game, he wasn't happy. I mean, he was happy. He was happy the team won and they came back and won, but he wasn't happy. He hasn't been happy all year, um, frankly. You know, it's just not quite been going his way. Like you said, it's a touch of unluckiness. Um, I, I saw a tweet yesterday as well during the game. He did roll one um, double play ball at one point. Someone saying that's only his sixth of the year that he's rolled, which... Seemed crazy because that's just Sandy's MO was like, okay, a guy gets on base. Cool. Here comes the double play ball. It was like automatic. 
We just haven't seen that as much this year. So I'm intrigued to see when, if it switches with Sandy. I'm intrigued to see if there's any further boo birds for Sandy Alcantara at any stage this year. Here's the crazy thing about that. Just that, that one topic in particular before we hit the final ad um, and get into some Garrett Cooper love. The interesting bit is I've not heard any boos all year for Jacob Stallings. I've not heard any boos for Gene Segura. But I've heard boos for Sandy Alcantara. Make that make sense. Jacob Stallings should be booed. He should have been booed by now. He's been rancid. He's been one of the worst players in the game. And so has Gene Segura. Sandy Alcantara was one of the best players in the game last year. And he's committed to this club. Sandy Alcantara will be the first Marlins jersey retired, in my opinion. 2-2 will never be worn again beyond Sandy Alcantara. And we're booing him. Come on. Come on. Boo Stallings, for God's sake. Anyway, with that being said, it's time for some therapy talk. And this show, <laughs> this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Um, and it's too easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. When we spend all of our time giving, it can leave us feeling stretched thin and burned out. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. Um, if you're thinking about starting therapy, then my strong recommendation is to give better help a try. Firstly, it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do to get rolling is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And if it's not quite right for you, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. What do you have to do? Simply find more balance with BetterHelp. And you visit betterhelp.com slash locked on MLB today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash locked on MLB. I feel much better now already. I feel cleansed after that ad. It's perfect. Sean, I feel like you may have been cleansed yourself yesterday. Garrett Cooper back in the lineup after a four-day gap. I was just really getting concerned about, is Coop going to be back on the IL with this ear issue? Um, but no, he bounces back big time. Three-run bomb in a huge spot for Garrett Cooper. Yes, it was a pole basher. It only just got there. Doesn't matter. They all count. And a three-run blast to tie it up for Gary Cooper, mate. Describe your reaction to that moment, if you can, Sean. Uh, it was it was a lot of enthusiasm. Um, <laughs> as I've already said, I'm not in exactly the greatest shape right now. Um, but yeah, I was uh, I was close to doing some damage to myself. And you're right, it was a bit of a, a pole basher. It was a bit of a wall scraper. Yeah. But if you revert it, I, it's like a hitting, you know, top... Top corner of a goal for me. That's how, that's how I looked at it. Top in, baby. That's it. And um, <laughs> double before as well. So Coop, Coop does this, doesn't he? He comes back and he'll come off the IL and first game back just hits. How does he do it? He did it last time. Yeah, he's he's just he's so he's so he's so consistent when he's playing. Yeah. Um, and the, the injuries uh, have obviously hampered this season as, as his whole career, but yeah. um, I just hope that Coop is back now um, because the Marlins are going to need him because we are now at the point in, as we're, you know, starting June, we're thinking, what is this team? Has this team got, uh, got a yeah. chance? And I think Coop in the lineup makes a huge difference for them, especially if he's going to be hitting like, well, I don't expect him to hit like this every night, but you know, Coop, Coop, a hot coop is so key to this team. And, and for me personally, I need it because the longer coop hits, the longer this team is several games over 500, maybe progressing further, the more and more likelihood is that he's not going to get traded and they're going to have to extend him. And these are all things that make me very excited. <laughs> Love to hear it, mate. And I'm completely with you. I mean, there's a few players in that boat. Hoy Soler obviously being another one of them. Dylan Floro being another, that if things go sideways, they will be moved. And that will be disappointing for us as Marlins fans in many ways. Um, great to see Coop back, though. I was concerned. Just the leave of absence length was making me concerned that this would be another IL stint. So I'm, I'm pleased that... And I think it probably helped 
that it was an A's series um, where perhaps they felt they could kind of do without Coop for a bit longer than maybe another series where, I don't know, maybe you're on the road and you're like, actually, we need to make a move earlier. Being at home against the A's, I think I gave the Marlins a touch more flexibility there to let him sit it out and get well, which is good. So well done to them. Well done to Skip. Well done to Kim for making the right moves. Well done for this sunshine as well, peering around these curtains, because I can't see a thing. I'm going to adjust this chair. There we go. There we go. For those watching, they'll be seeing me grappling with the sun <laughs> all episode long. This is the uh, the challenges of doing a UK-friendly recording. Nevertheless, a couple of topics to get into here in the last three, four minutes as we uh, bring it towards a 30-minute episode. Trevor Rogers. The discourse is heating up. Craig Mish is tweeting about it. Um, we're all commenting. We're all trying to work out what's going to happen when Trevor is back. What we did see yesterday, Trevor looks back. He's had two real solid rehab starts. He can't be far away. He can't be far away. The question will come, how do the Marlins get him back into the rotation or do they? Um, I'm not certain which path they go, to be honest with you. There's a few directions they could go. Some talk of a six-man. I'm not convinced that's the right path because you you then have one less bullpen arm for a a, a rotation that struggled with length all year. Plus, you then carry a Nuri Perez that's guaranteed only five innings, probably. So six man is going to really tax that pen. Don't think that makes a ton of sense. I think they just have a personnel decision to make if everyone remains healthy. Um, you know, look into the crystal ball here, Sean. You know, five days away, Rogers is back or available to come back what's the move what do you think they do i'm glad i'm not a gm because that's really yeah, tough, tough isn't it? so so rogers went 70 pitches is 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 that enough is he stretched out enough probably I mean, not is it? yeah your probably. next your next game is 90 pitches or there or thereabouts but do you want that at the major league level first game back i don't i think the way the rotation is set at the moment you, you don't need to feel rushed if, if, if they needed the arm, then you'd, you'd bring him straight up and he'd be pitching next time round. Mm. I think he has one more minor league game. The yeah. sixth man, I, I've seen it a lot in your comments, people going, what are you talking about sending Perez down? They'll go to a sixth man. They won't because, as, exactly as you put it, that bullpen's already taxed. We've been through it so much and I just don't get it. I don't get the idea of saving a spot for a sixth man and taking away from the bullpen. Eddie's improved I, in my eyes I thought he might be the next man to go down to the bullpen yeah uh, the the most likely and unfortunate for him situation is it might be Garrett because he's pitched well but he's not he is that he is that kind of unexpected guy that's overperforming mm -hmm. and, and how long can can the Marlins expect that to continue and I think that might be why he is I think if Eddie was still consistently wild with his pitches yeah. I think it would be him I uh, Perez I don't see it I think they've brought him up not they were in a bind they needed innings they needed a major league pitcher to come up but now he's up I want to see I want to see him hit his innings limit at the major league level mm -hmm. he's done enough done more than enough to deserve to yeah. continue in that but the Marlins have, we always talk about as we go into the season we've got too many arms and it never happens it never no. happens because the injuries happen and then poor performance happens. Right now, if Rogers comes up and is closer to the Rogers we saw in his first half of his career rather than the second half, the Marlins really do have an issue in that they've got six arms for five spots. Yeah, um, and it's it's going to be interesting to see how Kim and Skip manage it because there's there's no right answer. There's no easy no. answer. Um, and I don't want to think about how they could fix that by having an injury because let's let's chalk that off the board. Let's have that problem of having too many starters because it's a good problem to have. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. And, you know, you've got arms in the rotation that, that have minor league options available. So it's it'll be tough for the player that that feels the pain there and has to go back down to the minor leagues. But... It's the it's the right approach. The question is, really, it boils down to, do they continue with Uri Perez at the major league level? That's what it's going to boil down to. And if they want to keep him here, because let's be honest, he's got a 2.25 ERA and he deserves to be here. 
then which direction do you go? It's going to be really intriguing. I, it wouldn't stun me if they just leave Trevor Rogers down in, in, in AAA for a period. Like, let him continue down there. That's kind of always been my view. But again, to your point, like Braxton Garrett, you know, they prioritize Trevor over Braxton Garrett in the rotation to start the year. That's kind of how they view Trevor. And I don't think anything has fundamentally changed there. Brax is kind of the same guy that he was last year, to be honest with you. Nothing's overly changed with Brax. He's been effective. Um, you know, they, they squeezed him into the, you know, to the bullpen to start the year. But again, I feel, I always felt like that was the wrong call um, because you need him ready to go and he's proven his value. So I feel it comes down to Uri or, or Brax going down. I'd like him to ride the hot hand with Uri and potentially Brax is the guy that gets sent down. But it wouldn't stun me if Trevor is left down there for a touch longer. Just, you know, continue that rehab start. Like you said, mate, arms for days, real problems for a team over four games, a team four games over 500. I mean, these aren't problems the Marlins have faced for many a year. And the Royals are on deck, mate. The Royals are, I mean... They aren't a million miles away from the A's in terms of record. They're 18 and 41 heading into this series. They have one stud, I would say two studs. One older one in Sal Perez, who's having a good year. You've then got Bobby Witt, who's also having a tidy year. Other than that, you know, I'm struggling to pick out any studs in this Royals roster. Um, sweeps don't come easy, mate. But boy, oh boy, this looks like another opportunity for the Marlins to at least take a series. And if they play well with Braxton Garrett going in game one, with Lozado going in game two, and Eddie Cabrera going in game three, and I've seen the pitches the Rosa got going, there's a massive chance here for the Marlins to go back-to-back -back series sweeps, putting themselves seven games over 500. Do we dare to dream? I mean, I never dream. Um they they just they just lost a series to the Nationals. I think that's all you'd really need to know okay. about them. Uh, and Automatic sweep, then, brother. Automatic yeah, sweep. You, you got to look at them in the same way you did with the Athletics. They're they're a bad team, but you have to go there and beat them. And it is a case of right now. Yeah, a, a sweep right now would be huge. Yeah. I mean, to go seven games over five hundred in what then would be nearly middle of June. That's that's really when you start to think about this team. You've got the the ice hockey and the basketball teams in the finals, the last series now. So we've got probably a week or two of, of action and then it dies and it's just baseball. Yeah. If all those eyes turn around and see a team that are seven, eight, nine games over 500, mm -hmm. genuine playoff contenders, that could be huge for the Marlins. We might even see as high as 15,000 at the stadium. <laughs> Go easy now, Sean. Bloody hell. That's that is stretching it, but it's a really interesting point, and I'm I'm <laughs> I'm convinced that Bruce Sherman will not be enjoying the Heat and Panthers runs where his club is performing at you know over expectations. Maybe for some, they're in the hunt, and really the eyeballs are certainly not yet on the Marlins for obvious reasons, right? I mean, you only have to see the scenes after that game last night, the Heat game. Looked like they obviously had some sort of fan event at the actual Heat. Um, arena, Jeremy Taché with one of the best post-game, not live, but post-game reaction clips I've ever seen in my life. I mean, that was just truly stunning from Jeremy Taché. What a pro. What a pro's pro. He's like, you know, there's, what was it, babies are being lofted in the air or something, whatever the saying was. But love to see some of that in Lone Depot. And, mate, if they are, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten games over 500, you know, heading out of the back of June, Boy, oh boy, this team is relevant. And let's see what happens. Um, what is going to happen is we're going to end the episode there because we've run a touch long. So we better do it. We better, we better check out right now. Um, Sean Barrett, the UK GOAT, I appreciate you so much for joining me on Monday, of course, guys. Um, thanks for making Lockdown Marlins your first listen of the day and to the everydayers for joining me every single day, uh, of course, of the week. Uh, we'll be back, of course, tomorrow. And we will be, I, well, hopefully... We'll be talking about a Braxton Garrett gem and a fourth straight win for these Miami Marlins. We'll see you then, guys.